Well, hi everyone. Welcome to the PepsiCo Expert AMA session um, today that we're hosting with Tiana Cunningham from PepsiCo. Um, I'm Sandra Crawford from Alice. I lead marketing and events. And um, today we are bringing you this session as part of the Woman Made Initiative from PepsiCo, which is supporting female founders in the food and beverage industry. So this is a free session co-hosted by Alice and PepsiCo, and we are honored to be joined by Tiana Cunningham, who is the Senior Marketing Manager uh, for Innovation Strategy, Ideation, and Planning for Frito-Lay. She leads a team responsible for driving breakthrough innovation concepts across all snack brands, in addition to providing strategy and planning to support uh, brand innovation leads. Throughout, Brianna, uh, throughout Tiana's, sorry, five-year career at Frito-Lay. She's worked on a number of initiatives and projects, including integrating design thinking into process, design thinking process into innovation, driving growth on Lay's brand, both in the US and Middle East, and executing marketing campaigns with key strategic retailers. In addition, she brings several years of heart and hustle from her nonprofit background, always seeking to bring an agile approach and new ways of thinking into her roles. So we're going to start this session with a quick presentation from Tiana on design thinking. And at any point during her presentation or during the question and answer after, uh, please feel free to drop your questions for Tiana into the Q&A feature you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you'd like to, also let us know where you're joining from in the chat over on the right side of your screen. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to you, Tiana. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here and I appreciate everybody taking the time. So we're going to share a little presentation here to get us started and then uh, we'll get on our way here. All right, so um, as mentioned, I work on innovation um, and innovation is absolutely everywhere, right? It's in the products that it is that we see, it is in the work that it is that, uh, that female founders and folks within the community do, uh, which is super exciting. It's in processes, but also what you get out of innovation is design. Design and, and design thinking is probably one of my favorite pieces of, of innovation uh, because design truly is everywhere. <laughs> everywhere is uh, design. So when you think about it, if you look around for a second, uh, what you'll see are a couple things that are actually well designed, right? So you think about this Zoom interface, for example. Um, the location of the, the symbols and the messages and how things light up and, um, and the, the buttons and all of this stuff is designed, right? The way that the the webcam interacts with you and how you can see different uh, participants. All of this is designed around, around the experience. You look at the latest iPhone, which I sadly don't have because I just am too frugal, uh, but you look at things like phones, uh, you look at the cameras, we know what design and, and how Apple is known for, for great design and for really finding that unique mix and, and innovation even down to the chair that you're sitting at, right? Like that chair was designed to be comfortable. Or for those of you who are also a little bit frugal, that chair may be designed just to provide pure functional benefit without long-term comfort, right? Uh, but all of those things are examples then of design. But also if you look around, there's design in these processes, which is really super interesting. Um, so you may be the kind of person that turns on an alarm on your phone or on your watch, uh, and five minutes later, that alarm needs to come back on again because you're just not ready, right? Somewhere along the way, you've designed this process for waking up in the morning that goes something like this, right? Your alarm goes off, you decide, yes, I'm ready to get up, or no, I'm not ready to get up. You hit that snooze button, you say, I'll see you later. There's a delay, five Five minutes later, that same alarm comes right back on to remind you, okay, let's try this again, right? Uh, based on what it is that you need, design and the design of this process is how it is that, that supports what it is that you're trying to accomplish, which at the end of the day is like getting out of bed and doing what it is that you need to do to be a boss, right? Um, sometimes that's harder than others, but you know, wherever you are, it, it's still your design and it still works for you. And that's one of the key things about design is it actually starts with you, right? It's very human centered um, and innovation at its core is human centered. Um, so when you think about uh, innovation and designing for creative problem solving, um, then it starts and ends with this user and that user is you, or that user is the folks, the folks that it is that you serve or whomever it is, but it really is truly human centered and it's that unique 
experience of our personality and and um, of our of our uh, the way that we show up in the world right that determines exactly how something is designed for us so when we think about this idea of design thinking some of you may have heard of this it's kind of a buzzy thing going on around right now but design thinking at its core is really just a process for creative problem solving so there's not a problem that you can think of that you can't tackle with design thinking so it's actually pretty amazing um, and it compo it's composed of these kind of five dynamics, right? There's this piece of it that's around empathy. Again, human-centered. Empathizing with the person that you're designing or that you're solving the problem for is the first step. You move then into actually defining what is the problem that it is that you're trying to solve. You can't do that without empathy because you may think you have the problem defined. What you really realize is it's quite more nuanced than that, or there's a, another element of that, or attention to it, or a depth of it that you just haven't realized. Once you've really defined your problem, post that empathy, then that's when you can go and ideate. And it's one of my favorite things to do within PepsiCo and Frito-Lay. And honestly, a bit, I'm a little nerdy, a bit in life, right? I love ideation. I love the, pro the, the process of coming up with new ideas and solutions. So then design thinking takes you from these ideas that you generate through the ideation into prototyping and actually creating things to learn and finally testing out those prototypes to get, get a better understanding of what it is that you're trying to do. That in a nutshell is a design thinking process. So it's not super complicated, but it's a little bit different than sometimes the way that we approach problems. Why? It actually requires a different mindset. It requires you to really lead with empathy. And oftentimes we lead with strategy. We lead with analytics. We lead with guts. We lead with the whole lot. Um, but this really requires you to lead with empathy. It requires you to have this like unique optimism that you actually can deliver a solution for the problem. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what's toughest is that it requires you to embrace ambiguity, and that can be quite challenging for certain people, right? Um, through the prototyping phase, you end up making things with design thinking. It doesn't work unless you actually make it and try it and experiment and learn from whatever the failure successes are that you have um, and begin to iterate. This is not a linear process. Um, and then it helps to build some creative confidence, which is really, really important for developing innovation or if we're honest, for solving problems in an out of the box kind of way. It's not a linear process, right? There's a lot where you're, you have divergent and convergent thinking where you're starting big and the whole world is open and then you apply some constraints to be able to get to a better space. And even within that, you may do that and need to go back and do it again. It can be an iterative process, but whatever it is, it's not start here, finish here, and a nice clean, pretty line in between. So that can be tough for those of us that need that line uh, to be able to get to where we wanna go. So when we think about design thinking and kind of what this is and how it relates to the work that, that we do over at Frito-Lay, we've been huge in shaping what snacks are for the last 75 years. What in the world are we gonna do for the next 75 years? That's a lot where my job comes in and my role comes in and getting us to think about what the next 75 years of snacking looks like and how do we start designing for the future. Um, at the center of this, it's really like these three lenses that we apply to to uh, innovations where it becomes useful. One is simply desirability. Are people gonna like it, right? It, there's no Frito-Lay if people don't like the stuff that it is that we sell. Uh, the other part is feasibility. Do we have the technological capabilities to be able to actually produce it and make it? Where can we make it? How do we make it? What is that like? And then finally, is it commercially viable, right? Like, is our company gonna make money? Is this sustainable? Uh, how do we get there? So we have to apply these three lenses um, which may feel a little bit constraining, but at the end of the day, like you need a tight sandbox to play in when it comes to ideating, when it comes to innovating. Um, and so these are the three lenses that help kind of drive that. The design-led process for us actually looks like this. We start with some strategy and where you would have empathize and define, we call it kind of discover and define. That's where we really fall in love with the problem and try to get better learning that helps us there. We then brief ourselves <laughs> in an interesting way here to go into what is it that we need to go and explore and ideate. That's where our ideation, prototyping, and testing comes in. So when we think about uh, certain things that we want to make from a product standpoint, this is the process that we follow. And then we end up going and commercializing it and then starting to bring it to life following uh, our testing phase. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. Real life example, you heard it here first, maybe only here, um, but that's okay. Uh, take Lay's for example. A few years ago, Lay's was losing some volume to popcorn. That's a scary thing. Lay's is kind of the biggest brand in the building. The name is kind of on the door, right? 
So we better make sure if there's anything we get right, it's the Lay's brand. But it was losing some volume to popcorn. And what we needed to figure out was how do we get those folks that are leaving for popcorn to come back to Lay's, right? So starting with the end in mind and having a really clear business problem. So what's the first thing we do? We go and we spend some time with our millennial consumer who are in these moments that we like to call enjoy and indulge, right? Uh, so we go and spend some time with these folks and we learn that some of the reasons and, and some of the ways they were eating and consuming popcorn. They love to enjoy it at home. They really appreciated the tasty and the light nature of popcorn. And it kind of gave them a bit of a return to me moment. And these are the things that they weren't getting from Lay's. So we had to think about how do we actually uh, solve this for them? We went, we brainstormed some potential solutions through this fantastic ideation workshop. Um, and then we we came up with and then prototyped some solutions uh, based on based on some design criteria, right? So we have a ton of big ideas that come out of there. Uh, we'll call them bad, although I don't really believe there's a, such a thing as a bad idea. Well, sometimes people have bad ideas, but we won't tell them that. But we go through all these ideas to actually get to the right one based on our design criteria, what we know we have to deliver, right? We know that with popcorn, you get a higher piece count, that you get a nice clean eat, that people are mindful, right? Uh, eaters there. We know for the brand that Lay's has to taste good. Like we just don't win without it, that these things need to be kind of light and crispy, um, and that Lay's has a bit of a melt-away texture, and at the end of the day, we need to make this thing out of a potato. So we ended up designing uh, this product right here that many of you may know today as Poppables, right? And this is the initial Poppables concept. It was this unique shape from Lay's. It's a new snacking experience. It kind of delivered on some of the things that popcorn delivered then. And so we built out this concept and said, let's see how people, how people uh, like it. And we got fantastic feedback. People really liked it in our testing. And so we ended up ultimately launching Lay's Poppables in 2017. As you can see, the packaging came a long way from that original design. But at the end of the day, it's been a huge growth driver for the Lay's brand because we were able to start at the center uh, of that consumer. We were able to find that person that wasn't feeling Lay's anymore uh, and was going to popcorn. And we were able to put our arm around them and say, let here, here, right? We'll design something for you that meets your needs and fits really well within the Lay's brand. Um, so at the end of the day, like design thinking can be a really positive process to get you to where you need to go. And it can be used not just for product innovation, it can be used to solve a process or uh, to solve a challenge within your organization or to get you thinking in some ways that maybe you wouldn't have thought before. So I want to leave you with a couple of tips and then we'll jump into this question part because that's really exciting. Um, so the first tip is simply this, start with a problem. And I mean, always start with a problem, right? I could spend my day coming up with all sorts of ideas and it would be a waste of time if I didn't actually start with a problem. Uh, so when you're embracing design thinking, like start to think about what your hypothesized problem is. You'll refine it as you're empathizing and as you're further defining it through that design thinking process, but at least start with something in mind, right? And then I'll say this, I mean, care about people and care about this problem like you've never cared before. Like, like it's your nagging mama's retirement on the line and that if you don't get this right, she's gonna have to live with you and you don't have an in-law suite and she's bringing her BFF judgment with her and let's be honest, she just doesn't believe in your decision making. Like care like that, right? <laughs> like there's no tomorrow. Um, because at the end of the day, when you're designing for humans and you get as deep into human connection as you possibly can, you're gonna deliver things that humans actually need and humans actually want. It's going to make it better, trust me. I'll also say don't be afraid to learn or fail, like, or learn while you fail, or learn while you're succeeding, or, I mean, if you're anything like me, just completely redefine success and failure and challenge anybody who wants to challenge you. Like, be okay with that, right? This is an important mindset, important thing to embrace. And then finally, gosh, this is fun. I hope you have fun with all this. Uh, innovation and problem solving can be simply amazing. Um, and when your solution is right designed, because it's built at the heart of the, the consumer and you're thinking about the viability and the feasibility and the desirability and you're empathizing like nobody's business, I mean, you really get to some amazing things. Innovation is not complicated, actually. It's taking things where there's a problem and it's solving it, right? And it's things that are driving your business much better than oftentimes we do here at Frito-Lay. Um, so have fun with that and embrace that. And I think it'll be okay. So I'm about at the end of my time here for my short presentation and design thinking may feel like this, right? It may feel like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to catch this treat and I'm trying to focus on it and it's a lot coming at me. But there's a ton of resources. There's a ton of help out there. Google design thinking, check out IDEO, check out Stanford's design school. There's a lot of resources out there that can be very, very helpful. And at the end of the day, there's my email address. 
So feel free to reach out to me for you folks there that are on the call live, for those that are watching the recording. Really appreciate you allowing me to take a couple minutes just to share design thinking and innovation and creative problem solving with you. Um, and I'm excited now to get into some questions. So Team Alice, let's stop the screen awesome. share over <laughs> now and let's, let's get into some of this, shall we? That was amazing, Tiana. And uh, can't say enough how much I love that last slide. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, first question we have for you is, how does PepsiCo decide on a strategic direction when marketing a new product? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, so I know some some of you several of you have probably watched one of the previous um, expert sessions with Homie, who talked a little bit about like how brands grow framework. Um, so when it comes to PepsiCo and Frito Lay, we're thinking of listen. If my brand is going to grow, sometimes that's going to be because I need to do much better about getting it out there where it needs to be and increasing my distribution. Sometimes it means that I've got to increase my mental availability, right, and my situational salience and all those fun words. Sometimes it's because you actually have to write design a product for somebody that it's not that's that needs to meet a need that you're not currently meeting right and that's where innovation oftentimes comes into play. Um, so our innovation strategy is actually part of the holistic brand strategy. Uh, you can't do one without the other and you can't do one independently from the other because at the end of the day like we've all got limited resources. So we have to kind of prioritize what is going to move the needle the most. So when we look through our brand strategies and we see that we're not meeting a need a functional need and emotional need through innovation products, then that gives us a lot of push to go and try to create something new, right? Maybe it's because there's a new occasion or way, uh, occasion that we're trying to capture. Maybe it's a different kind of a consumer that we're trying to capture, but that's how we would uh, then justify, I think, and strategize going into innovation being a solution um, and then being able to kind of enter into that design thinking uh, framework uh, to be able to go and create what what does that product need to be so very similar to what you saw with this Lay's example like you start with this problem oh shoot <laughs> you know losing losing share here losing volume here uh, need to to correct the business here's an opportunity for us that, that we've seen that we've we've analyzed and now let's go figure out what that innovation solve is and and jump in and create some magic that's awesome yeah, and I wonder um, also how much um, marketing data maybe factors into these decisions. Um, do you use that a lot at uh, PepsiCo to drive those decisions? Oh my gosh, we are so data heavy. I, sometimes you sometimes you feel like, geez, if we could just trust ourselves a little bit more, right? It can be very, very challenging. Uh, but we use a ton of data, right? So we're always constantly thinking about where, how and where we're positioned in the marketplace. We use a lot of sales data to see how we've been doing. We look at a lot of historical performance, especially of our innovation items. Like if we perform an audit, how did that do? How did it meet our expectations? Did we deliver like we thought we would? Um, and even into a lot of this innovation, uh, as you're, you're exploring different solutions and things of that nature, you can say something like, how big is this category? Is this a growing category, right? Um, you know, how are my competitors doing in this space? What are they doing uh, differently than we are? So the, the data really gets you a good picture of where your opportunity spaces kind of pop up. Um, across how people are using your product and how things are, are selling and what flavors are popping. And I mean, we've even had some conversation uh, before around like the use of things like artificial intelligence or, you know, trends and getting on that, that forefront of some of the trends and understanding where certain trends are in the adoption curve to see where opportunities are. So everything that we do is, is reinforced with, uh, with data that supports the decision making that we, that we have. Because at the end of the day, it's really, really hard to prioritize what you're going to go after without some kind of a numbers validation to say that I'm headed in the right place and I'm going after the biggest opportunity. So that's mm -hmm. how we, we integrate it. And um, the data never stops coming. So <laughs> as long as people are buying, the data doesn't stop coming. So it's a, it's a good problem to have for sure. Yeah, always a part of it, I'm sure. Um, I wonder also if, uh, if you might give an example of how a founder, maybe a solo founder who's just getting started, um, like, what are the pieces of data they should be looking at um, when they're trying to launch their first product? Yeah, so I think just a lot of industry analysis. So 
you're a solo person. I get it, right? I come from my pre prepsico life. Life is uh, all nonprofit. So I mean, that hard and hustle thing is real, right? You're doing your best to try to, to find something, but somewhere you saw an opportunity, somewhere you, you saw a need. Um, and there are so many things online, so many places online where you can go and kind of find some uh, data and some resources to help you understand what's going on in this industry, what's going on in this category, um, what's the future of this. There are reports and things of that nature that you can buy. Um, there's a lot of great, um, uh, great articles written about different categories, different products and that kind of thing. So start by just knowing the space, knowing this world, right? Right? Because inevitably, we're not usually creating something that's crazy brand new to the world. It's some iteration of an existing thing, or it's something that maybe was tried before its time, but there's always a connection where existing data is out there. Um, so go find those, those sources, buy some of those reports that help you to, to build a solid business case around why this is the territory that you want to go into. Secondly, um, now I'm probably, you probably saw my bias towards Apple uh, products, but I've, I trust Apple News and I look, I use a lot of the Apple News. So I go in and I will, if I'm interested in a space, I will add all these keyword searches. You can do the same thing with Google search engine, create alerts, get weekly reports and like inundate yourself with conversations around uh, these topics. Um, there's a lot going on out there and inevitably you'll find an article, you'll find a report where there are embedded reports in there or data points and facts that, that will have a source to it. Um, and you can see what that source is and try to go find the original or you can leverage what these data points are that help you to make your case. So um, totally understand it. Not everybody can pay. I don't listen. I don't even know how much we pay <laughs> for some of these uh, data sources, but there's a lot out there that's there for you to make, um, make some really good decisions based on what you have today. So you just have to go after it. That's awesome. Awesome um, advice, Tiana. Um, okay, next question I have is how does PepsiCo innovate on design and how can a solo founder uh, similarly bring innovation into their strategy? Yeah, so um, so the our innovation pro uh, process is just like what I was showing um, in those few slides there. So if you take kind of a design-led approach, um, start with what your hypothesized problem is, what it is that you think that you're trying to solve, then I'd recommend and that you would go and you find some folks, get some folks together and ask them about this, right? So um, let's see, I'm just trying to think of a good example of what this could be, but maybe I don't want you to, I don't want to give a competitive example where you're going to try to come up with the next new chip that does something better than what we do. <laughs> um, I don't want to spark that, right? Uh, but let's say you're actually trying to you know, develop a new chip and you found out that you're, you know, you're, you have this idea about, about some kind of a snack food that you think could be much better than what's out there today. Uh, get some folks that are, that, eat these kind of snacks, right? Find the folks in your community, in your neighborhoods, find your friends, find your family. Like you can start really small and close in, right? It doesn't have to be this huge study where you're traveling to like 14 cities across the US to do these focus groups, but start by talking to some folks and getting a sense of what's wrong with what it is that they're, they're using today and what their level of dissatisfaction is. And uh, you know, where are the tensions? Like. So you want to spend some time with your consumers or with these folks that you, you want to try to design your, your innovation for, thinking about where are their tensions? What are the problems that they have with their product today? And how can you then come up with ideas that solve it? The process is going to be very, very similar. Um, so I think you'll just want to embrace that as a process, right? Because the exact same thing that we do here at Frito-Lay, we just spend a lot of money doing it, but there are some ways in which we do it internally, right? So there's some work that we did a couple years back where we we got a lot of the women in the in the organization together, held some focus groups, ran a little survey monkey screener with them, right, for free, where you can only do the max of 100, <laughs> 100 responses, um, and then got them in a room talking about some products we were thinking about. I mean, they're consumers too, right? And it's a kind of it's a, it's a kind of simple way to get some feedback, but that's all you really need is to start getting in front of people, get to the heart of the tensions. Um, you can spend a, a, a day, you know, actually just coming up with some and brainstorming some solutions, bring, bring a mix of creative people in, bring some users in potentially, uh, you know, just bring a, a nice, nice diverse group of folks in to help brainstorm this. And I mean, you'd be amazed at the kind of things that you can come up with based on a simple kind of process. 
um, when you just trust yourself and trust, you know, what you're doing. Um, so I think I answered the question. I think there was a second <laughs> part of the question. Tell me if I've messed that part up. <laughs> no, that, no, that was perfect. And actually, I uh, kind of want to move to one that just came in uh, from an audience member. Uh, Jay Hearn asks, um, along that same vein, how do you motivate founders or product managers to engage in an innovation or primary research process that might tell them their baby's ugly or yeah. not meeting a consumer need. <laughs> oh, that's that look at your baby. Isn't your baby, isn't that so nice? That's funny. Where you have to use that language where you don't say the baby is ugly, but you just try to not say the baby is cute, right? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that there's a, there's a, a purpose that you can drive as a founder in what it is that you're doing, right? Like, it, what's amazing about about you guys is that you guys start with like a really cool story, right? Of why you're into what it is that you're doing or or how you're moving through, right? And we don't oftentimes have that narrative. And so oftentimes the motivation is we want to make our business plan or you want a good bonus or whatever it is, right? But it's not usually driven on like the foundation of the story. Um, but what I think does motivate us is bringing purpose into the workplace and understanding what your unique value contribution is. Um, and I think that also is, is really buoyed by the empathy piece of it. If you can begin to say, listen, this is not about the right or the wrong, right? There's not a right design or a wrong design. It's about it being right for this consumer or right for this customer. So it's up to us to try to make sure we optimize this as best as we possibly can. So is it ugly? No, it's not ugly. But is it the best iteration that we can have for this person? And does it uniquely solve this need? You know, let's figure out. And so I think it's about more about the journey and about trying to figure out what you can actually do that solves the ultimate needs. And if you're solving those needs, great, but it's, it's a challenge to inspire us to be able to actually go after the things that are gonna solve needs better than what's out there today. And I think that you can think about what that end state is, and that end state is if we're victorious in doing this, this is gonna be an amazing product. And there's a lot of pride I think that people have in not just making something, not just creating anything, but creating something that's useful, creating something that's helpful, creating something that's dynamic. So if you bring your passion and your energy around this piece of empathy and help people to see the end state in mind and the impact that they're going to have um, on the lives of folks whose lives will really be enriched because of what it is that you're making, like run with that, right? Treat yourself like a nonprofit in that sense. We're here to make people's lives better. We're here to t tell your story, whatever your founding story is, tell that story and then talk about how each person plays a unique role um, in delivering those results and, and getting there. And that when you do it together and design together, it's not just a person off in a workshop somewhere, but everybody's a part of this design thinking process, then I think it'll, it'll be a, a stronger motivator for sure. Um, and then I'd also say include them on the research process in a positive way, right? Make sure that the questions are designed around what is working, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing versus going in with the negative um, that may kind of shun people, make people feel a little bit bad. Uh, find out what works really, really well and think about what else you can optimize. And I think you'll bring them on board in, in a much better way. That's a fantastic question, by the way. Woo yeah, and great Don't answer. Don't anybody upset about their baby. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a tricky thing to, to navigate. And I like that keeping it really tied to the mission and the story of the company and um, making, all, making sure all team members know that and feel like it's you know, part of their mission as well. Mm -hmm. um, one more question around this innovation before we kind of shift uh, into a few uh, different uh, topics. But yeah. um, so Anna asks, uh, she's curious to know how you know when an idea or project or potential product um, your team is working on is not the innovation your team is looking for. Yeah. I think, uh, so two things. One is that sometimes when you start a design thinking process, you don't actually know or you shouldn't know what you're looking for. Um, so I think if you, you already have it, so, and that's tough, right? And I'll be honest, sometimes that happens. We start with a solution in mind instead of really just like pushing back all of our, our preconceived notions around what the solution is. Um, and so hopefully through the empathy and defining phase, that part can be kind of tweaked out. It's okay to have a hypothesis of what the end looks like, but let's be really open, right, about what that should be um, and what that design criteria. So that's something that we use a ton, which is across, and, and for us, we, we actually have like this 360 experience design, which is across the eating experience, the buying experience, and the culinary experience, what are those key things that are going to actually solve what it is that the person is trying to solve? 
Um, so we stick true to that, which I think is really important. The other thing is I think there's, we generate a ton of ideas during ideation, right? So for example, um, we recently were doing an ideation um, on the, with the dips team, with our Frito-Lay dips team. So right now we have a lot of salsas, we have a lot of quesos, that kind of thing, right? They're all in little jars, they're right underneath the bags. I encourage you to go buy them if you don't. I don't know if that's allowed on this webinar, but I mean, they didn't tell me the rules. So we'll just, we'll just run with that. Um, so we're doing some ideation and we must have come up with, you know, 200 ideas that were generated easy from the one day ideation workshop. Uh, from there, you don't just necessarily say, here's the one, and then you just have to move that forward, right? We, we distilled that down uh, to 40 ideas, um, you know, that we felt like had a lot of energy, met what we were looking for in the job. And then that's when we started um, looking at then, are there any that can be kind of combined? Are there any elements of these that we like for one another? And then you can start to just whittle that number down a little bit more and start doing that prototyping phase, right? So in that prototyping phase, which is why it's so important to actually make it, um, and you guys know this, I'm sure very, very well with products, but when you're prototyping, that gives you the real good opportunity to then help further distill uh, down what it is that you want to move forward with um, into things that are that are even better, right? Uh, and again, it's prototyping and making to learn. So the goal is that if you spend the amount of time that you need to actually learning, uh, then you can get to better types of products. And oftentimes, there's not just one that stands out, there's multiple. When you eventually distill down to one and figure out out what your prioritization is you know I think you've been on a journey the whole time with it and so I think it's less about oof you know we're not as thrilled with this and more about um, you know here's what we still have to do to make this better or let's reach back into our, our bucket of, of other uh, uh, pr prototypes that we've made and see what else may be here um, so I think that that's going to be really important to make sure that you don't just end up with one idea, but that you've got plenty of ideas to be able to choose from. Um, and sometimes we even do that and we say, okay, this one looks like this will be good if we, if we can make this launch in 2021. We'll save this one for 2023. Like you can actually plan those out and, and create more of a pipeline. The other thing is I would ask a little bit about, and without obviously knowing the full context to some of the unique aspects of your situation, um, I would also say like this, how, this whole idea of failure or something not being good enough, I think is just such an interesting thing and one that a lot of times corporations for sure have to battle, right? And, and that is like, what, what do we consider failure? What do we consider successful innovation? Um, I think it's really easy to know if it's successful after we've launched it and then you do a post audit, post launch, right? And if it makes lots of money, it's successful. It's really hard to know if it's successful when it's just in a pipeline or before it's actually been launched. So you have to really trust a lot of your consumer feedback um, and some of that testing in advance, right, to, to help you to know how good you feel about it and evaluate it on a couple of lenses. So for us, when we take a project before we go actually commercialize and make it, spend the money to go in and mass produce it, um, we have all of our cross-functional partners, sales, finance, supply chain, co-manufacturing in many cases, the brand team in many cases, you know, our innovation partners, our R&D partners, product, um, packaging, all of those folks kind of assess multiple concepts towards the end of our journey to be able to give us their point of view on, on what's working and, and what we need to optimize, how we can do it and if we can do it. If you feel at the end of the day that this, this proposal or this product actually meets those, the center of those three lenses, Consumers, do they want it? Absolutely. And we make it? Absolutely. You know, will it make us money? Absolutely. I feel like you've got something that's worth trying. Um, and at the end of the day, here's the, here's the beauty of where you guys are right now. I mean, I'm in this corporation and I love it. All right, don't get me wrong. But boy, is it a lot harder to fail in an organization like Frito-Lay when you have millions of dollars at stake, you know, or, or hundreds of millions of dollars at stake than it is sometimes in a situation where you're a small business or a founder or you're, you're getting something started. You can throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks like crazy. You can test and learn like crazy, right? You can launch things and try things and then pull them off. You can use online um, and e-commerce to go in and throw some things out there, some direct to consumer things, and you can get real time transactional data and feedback in a very low risk kind of way. So I encourage you to take those risks and kind of redefine what you think of as success um, and what you think of as failure. And I think then that will help uh, move the needle in that aspect. That's Phew, I felt like yeah, that was I a link. It is. Sorry, geez. No, that was great. So I think exciting. it is very. <laughs> it's very. Um, yeah, that point about how lucky founders are to be able to 
really quickly ideate, really oh, quickly so implement ideas, take them off, learn from yeah. them, fail fast, um, as it were. Yeah. Um, I think that is a, a really good space to be in. And um, that learning in the initial stages of the company just will only help you as you continue to grow. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I'm shifting gears here a little bit. Um, yes. So marketing, as we all know on this call, is an ever-changing landscape. Um, so what used to work with a printed newspaper ad has given way to social ads, which now seems to be giving way to influencer campaigns. Um, I'm wondering, what are some new marketing tactics that you're seeing a lot of impact with? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's interesting. The, right now, like the space really is, is social, right? And it's weird because there used to be a time where there were digital marketing people. Well, now everything is digital. So like that word is not even relevant um, anymore. There's a lot more when it comes to the social space. The influencer space really is continuing to gain, uh, to gain a lot. Um, it's interesting within the social space, though, because for a while and for some of our brands like Facebook marketing was like perfect right depending upon what a lot of people are selling uh, this social still makes a ton of sense in this space um, what's interesting and depending it, it all depends on who it is that you're trying to reach right and where they are and where they're going um, so for example for some of our Gen Z folks if we're not doing snapchat things then we don't have any business calling ourselves reaching you know some of these Gen Z uh, some of these Gen Z consumers. So uh, for us, we're still spending a lot of time there. More on the emerging stuff is more of the voice activated, right? So think about the integrations with things like Google Assistant, with uh, Siri, with uh, Alexa and Amazon, the voice activated devices. So I think that's a space that's super, super interesting right now um, to try to figure out how to, how to test and learn in some of those spaces. What you'll find is that the majority of your efforts are gonna be most well spent in some of your traditional channels in terms of what traditional is now, which is social and influencer, um, you know, not necessarily TV or newspaper or print or whatever it is. Um, but you still want to try to reserve a little bit to be able to test out some of those those new things. Um, think about uh, the short term video. Think about apps like TikTok, Snapchat. And it, again, it depends on who it is that you're trying to reach, um, because that's really going to vary what what tactics and what levers you go and pull to reach that group. Um, but yeah, definitely stay, stay up to date on new tech, stay up to date on marketing. Again, Google news, Apple news, whatever it is, you know, fill in as many keywords as you can and just stay, stay in touch with, with the content and, and, um, follow some influencers that are, that are getting into that space. So like one person that I absolutely love following on YouTube is Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. Oh yeah. Uh, that guy is, uh, I mean, he'll let you have it with the language, but <laughs> I mean, he's got some great conversations around what's working, what's not um, in that space. And he's been pretty good at, at kind of helping to show uh, what those early, early spaces are. YouTube is probably another one that I'll say YouTube is, is huge, right? If you're not doing things on YouTube, um, that's, a, that's a huge, huge miss. Mm -hmm. Great question. So yeah, and um, thinking through these um, different channels as well, we've got a question from an attendee, um, which is how do you ensure seamless branding across social channels yeah. and traditional media outlets? What should the messages have in common and yeah. how should each differ for specific audiences? That's great. So what we have the privilege of leveraging are things like brand books, right? And so you think about this idea of design again, and it's how your brand is showing up in the world, right? So um, if I were to do a weekly, I'll put it like this, if I were to do a weekly chat with you all, and you know that I'm here, I've got my little glasses on, you know, I've got my little Apple watch and all this, and uh, we get to know each other, and I've built a, a rapport with you over time. But then one day I showed up and I was preaching Samsung, and you know, my hair looked way different. And uh, you you know, everything else looks different. You think, oh, what's going on, right? Like it's, it's uh, what's, what's going on with Tiana. If I were to show up like that in multiple places, you would have think, you would have thought I'd lost my mind. You'd say, we need to have an intervention. Something's wrong. Something's changed, right? It's the same way that your brands show up. When they show up with some consistency across visual identity and that sort of thing, then people begin to get to know who you are. They understand who you are. When you start to kind of divert from that and get a little bit funky, they're like, oh, 
bad day? Like what's going on, right? And at, at the end of the day, if they really start showing up like crazy, you think something is wrong, we need to go stage an intervention. So think about your brand just like you would the way a person would show up, right? Um, and so we have the, the fortunate um, ability to create these brand books and design books that basically say for the design of the brand, here's the fonts that we're going to use, right? Here's the logo and the style that we're going to use. Here's how it should show up. Here's how it should look and be displayed versus how it should not be displayed. So I think just from a very basic visual identity, there's a consistency that you can have, a consistency in terms of your tone. We all know Wendy's. What kind of brand is Wendy's? Wendy is one sassy girl. She gets at it, doesn't she? She doesn't mess around. She claps back. Like that's who she is and that's how she shows up. And it's amazing, right? People have fallen in love with it. Um, so you want to show up in tonality and in visual presence the same way. Now across platforms, so that's, that can be consistent across platforms. But what, your, what type of content you post across platforms can vary, right? So if you think about something like YouTube, people are searching YouTube for how-to type of thing. They want certain inspiration. They want to learn, right? YouTube is actually becoming like a bigger search engine than Google. Google, I think, um, which is insane, right? So if you think about the applications for video, it's going to be a little bit different for, between that and the application for something like Twitter, right, or something like Snapchat. Um, and so you have to know what each platform does and does well and who it reaches well and make sure you customize uh, your message. So an example of this is Gary Vaynerchuk, who I was just telling you about. Gary V gives a lot of marketing advice. Um, but he is very active and when he creates content, and I know this can be very challenging, but when he creates content, he takes one talk that he gives, one speech that he gives, and his team chops it up into a bunch of sections. So one of those will be a quick video that's on LinkedIn that's tied to a specific message that he wants to emphasize. One of those may be a longer version, longer form version that's on YouTube for people to get the full uh, creative content there. He may tweet out a quote from it and an image, right, or a meme or something like that onto, onto Twitter. And and so he uses very similar pieces of, of the same package and chops it up to create multiple types of content. So you can think about how would I take something bigger and chop it down into smaller sections to use across multiple platforms, slightly tweaking it because you, you have to be clear that you know your audience and that you know uh, exactly what the platform is best for. Um, but at the end of the day, it ends up being worth it, right? Because you still show up as the same person, the same Gary V that curses on YouTube is also going to have, you know, that tone on LinkedIn, who's also going to have that same tone on, um, on Twitter, but there's still different types of uh, messages over the course of that that allow you to really get different, different snippets of him. That is great, great, I, um, great tactics. And I'm um, also leading into this next question. Um, so a lot of that and taking things in and repurposing across channels and figuring yeah. out your strategy across channels. It takes a lot of time, right? And a lot of our audience today are founders who may not even have another person on their team yet. And yeah. they can only dedicate maybe 10 hours a week or some you know, portion of their time to marketing. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, what's the most important thing they should focus on? I, I think, know that's a, that's a yeah, pretty intense so question. What a horrible question. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's a really hard question to ask because, uh, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend. It's going to depend on the where you are in your business and, and your maturity of your business. It's going to depend on what you've been doing. It's going to depend on if you've been investing in certain things and that hasn't been working and you're trying to find something different or if what you've been doing has been working. Um, it's hard to answer that kind of question without like analyzing. So if you need to take a step back for a second and start to think about uh, what are the different things that I'm doing within my organization today? What's working and what's not working? Where, and you get a lot of these metrics, right, from your marketing efforts. So if you're investing in in, in SEO, if you're investing in Facebook or in um, Instagram or whatever, then you're going to get some feedback on how that, that's going for you, right? Do a little analysis over all the different channels that you're investing in, how much you're investing in those channels and what your ROI is and see where your money's working the hardest for you. Um, if you need to reduce the number of platforms that you're on for a bit so that you can focus on what's driving the most growth, then, then do that. But to say which one is kind of hard to to say, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I would encourage you to take a step back from it and then take a look at, at where you're investing. If you're not investing at all, not even in social, I'd say that would be a great place to get started um, for sure. But you may find 
that, and this is part of that whole brand strategy, you may find that right now it's less of a marketing problem and more of a distribution problem, right? Um, or that you have less of a, a distribution problem, and more of a pricing problem. Like you'll have to do that full analysis of your business and really think about what the efforts are that you need to do and focus on that are going to drive the most growth from you, uh, for you. And then think about how you can creatively outsource or pull some people together to help support you in some of those other areas. I hear um, an unpaid internship these young people are still going for these days, right? Or uh, do you have some folks uh, especially if you're trying to, to reach a younger audience there, some folks that really need some, some experience and have some social savvy that can help you create content, right? How do you even use things like Fiverr, right? Or, or platforms in which you can outsource some of the creative work um, and work with somebody maybe consistently that can know your brand a little bit and some of those low cost ways to be able to get some of that done. Um, so that's what I would do is I'd start with just kind of analyzing and doing a review of where your business is today Think about those areas uh, that you have incredible bright spots and you're really excited about the, the return that you're getting. Think about those areas that aren't working as hard for you and maybe focus some of your areas on, um, on, on investing more into where it's working hard or if there's a tweak to be made with the places that aren't working hard but you know you should be winning, then go ahead and figure out, and again, you can use this design thinking process, uh, but figure out why that's not working for you. Um, and then you can be able to turn the corner from there. That's great. Um, and in a similar vein, also, um, just if you have any tactics that you might recommend to a founder that doesn't have a ton to spend. So I know you said unpaid interns, potentially, yep. or unpaid um, interns, work with the school. Um, I think it's a really interesting opportunity to go find a local school or college and, and create a program with them. They're trying to get uh, young people that are students to do more experiential learning. I think people realize that that's very valuable in addition to book learning, right? So it may be that you actually propose a program that you work with them for the sake of a year, right? Uh, over the course of a year and work with them to be able to help do things for you um, or not. Um, I know that there's a lot of small business resources, things like this Alice community, right? These are the kinds of things that you can look for and find. I mentioned Fiverr and I'm sure there's a lot of other things like Fiverr. I haven't had to use them in, in too long, but I've done uh, logo design and things like that through Fiverr. And they're, they can do video production and you can find people to do some of those micro uh, tasks for you. Uh, task rabbit, that sort of thing. Like there's a lot of sites now that will help you to outsource uh, some of the work that it is that you need done. Um, and then, you know, as well as a founder, sometimes it's just good old fashioned late nights um, as you're digging into some of these things. And so it's just a balance of what can you outsource versus um, what you may have to kind of dive into uh, into yourself. And we can think of maybe a couple other um, resources specifically. So I, I left my email address um, and I think you'll probably be able to share my email address uh, after this as a follow up anyway so if you have something more specific that you're looking for feel free to shoot me a note and I can I can share with you what I know great great um, and um, we've got a ton of questions that have come in so thank you all for asking those um, if you have more please keep asking them in the Q&A feature or the chat feature um, so one that came in from uh, Jay Hearn um, so what advice would you give a healthy snack startup with a loyal customer base about approaching a company like PepsiCo? And approaching, I'm guessing, approaching for acquisition or investment, is that, is that probably what we're? <laughs> I would guess so. Yeah. Um, Jay, if you wanna uh, put in the chat. Oh, acquisition and investment. Woo, and fancy, fancy words, right? Um, so I, I think we I actually have a separate mergers and acquisition team. They're really hush hush because some reason, like anytime, you know, people get word or, or wind of what it is that we're doing and companies that we're looking at acquiring, it impacts stock prices and things of that nature. So they're a very quiet group. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, we've, we've traditionally looked at companies and you can think about mergers and acquisitions in a couple different ways, but, you know, there's usually some kind of, um, intellectual property or capability that we either don't have today or don't have don't want to put uh, the energy and the resource into building internally right so when you think of big companies we probably have enough money that if we wanted to go do something similar to what you're doing in a disruptive way we probably could right but we may not have the appetite for what it would take to get there and so you have the advantage as you're as you're growing your organization um, and so when you're, when you're thinking about how to be attractive you want to have have something there that we can't do that you can uniquely offer that would that would make sense then for you to be acquired right 
Um, the other piece of it is there's several food and beverage companies nowadays that have incubators and have uh, programs where they work with startups or they work with uh, organizations like yours to either think about how do we help you grow and then we'll either buy you out or, um, uh, you know, or you will continue to be able to thrive on your own. And so I would look into and kind of research what some of those programs are. Um, and then we also, we, we go to all the major food and beverage expos, right? So Expo East, Expo West, there's there are PepsiCo people running around there checking out uh, who's who. And so show up in those places where you're also gonna have larger organizations um, and invest in those places that you can get visibility and be able to show off a little bit of your, pro of your product. And I think we've probably seen some folks come through there too that have been really, really interesting. That's great that you mentioned that, Tiana. Um, we also, when, uh, when Tappan Shaw joined us earlier this year, he mentioned trade shows as a yeah. way to get in front of distributors, potential yep. investors, et cetera. Um, I'm curious, what would you recommend from a de design perspective uh, to make a booth or experience stand out? That's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I think, um, I think you just have to be true to yourself. I don't know that there's a big flashy design booth thing, right? I think when you show up to those kind of events, trade shows and things, you just need to represent your brand and bring your brand to life. So we talked a little bit about that visual identity, like whatever your valuable assets are, make sure that you're keeping that top of mind for the folks that are passing by, so that you're able to communicate those things to them as they, as they, as they roll by. So I don't think it's about the flashy and it's not about the shiny. And I think the kind of people that are looking at either acquiring companies or doing business with companies will see right past all of that, right? Like they have to get a little bit deeper in and get to know you. And so I think if you're true to yourself and represent your brand uh, and your brand's voice, the way that it should be represented and you have something that's worth, <laughs> you know, acquiring, right? Sometimes we, we have things that don't have enough differentiation or don't actually deliver on what we say that we're going to deliver on and in those cases like we have to optimize what it is that we're offering instead of just try to use more marketing speak behind it you know if we're honest and that's a tough that's a tough message but um it's an important one so be yourself show up you know represent what you do best and why you really are differentiated and and why you are who you are and tell your story um and i think what exactly what you need uh, you'll find that's great great advice um We've got a couple of questions that have come in about packaging. Um, so I'll start with the kind of uh, broader one. Uh, how does package design factor into your marketing strategy in a consumer brand? Uh, yeah. What are some aspects of packaging to consider? Yeah, that's a that's a great, great question. Um, so that's where it really helps to have a design team and to, to outsource some of our design work, right? It makes it a lot easier. Uh, but packaging is so important. I think for many years, uh, Frito-Lay has been very insistent on it, there being, uh, you know, clean packaging, clean look, right? Easy to read. The fonts matter. The font sizes matter. Um, we've also focused a lot on photography um, to, to encourage appetite appeal, um, you know, if you think about, it, especially in some of the health and wellness spaces, like when you think about taking some of those healthy ingredients, you're not adding artificial colors, you're not adding some of those things, it doesn't look as appealing, right? Um, maybe don't put something that doesn't look very appealing on the cover of a, of a package, right? Be mindful of some of those things. Um, so packaging plays a tremendous role because so many people actually make the decision at the shelf. You can invest in it. You're going to get some people through the online and the, the digital marketing. You're going to get some people because you're sending out sampling and you're doing these things. But the majority of the folks that see you are going to see you at the shelf. Um, so you want to make sure and evaluate a little bit around what, what your competitors are doing in that space. Think about size of bag. Think about type of bag. Think about the right design of the package for the product and, and for the product's use. Um, so be mindful about that. Think about how your, your bag may or may not get lost in the shuffle. Um, sometimes you can think about colors, especially as flavor cues or ingredient cues, right? So if we're doing something that's a jalapeno flavor, you'll see it in a green, right? If you're doing something uh, that's a lightly salted uh, version, you'll see that in a blue, right? So there's certain kind of industry-wide cues that, that help people know what it is that they're looking at. Um, and so just think about how to keep it really clean, how to keep it appealing. And then again, use the opportunity to test it out with a bunch of people. Do a, do a survey, have a bunch of different options, figure out what people like best and and get some real-time feedback from consumers and be willing to, to use your agility uh, to be able to optimize as needed that's awesome awesome advice um and the more specific question that came in about packaging is um 
we're wondering if the two labor two color labeling on our product is not eye catching enough. What is your opinion on green against white? Green um, against white. That's a good question. I I think it depends on what green against what white, right? It's hard to uh, be very, very specific, but um, I think usually, I mean, when, when you think about signs and things like that, I, I want to say blue and white and green and white. If you think about street signs and things, uh, how they tend to work, you can you can look around and get some inspiration on your two color from other things. Where are you seeing green against white in the world, right? Not just within packaging, not within just food and beverage, not just within any uh, regular logo, but just think about in the world, how does it show up? It's hard to say without seeing it, um, because I think a lot of signs, blue and white is is kind of the key one, but it depends on what the whole color scheme is. It depends on what your, your tone of your brand is, what voice you're going with, what your personality is. Um, if it's environmental, and so you use a lot of green and a lot of natural colors uh, because you have a big sustainability push and that probably makes more sense. Um, so it really, really depends, but you know, feel free to email me and, and show me what you're thinking about and happy to provide uh, some additional feedback. Great. Um, okay, we only have a few minutes here left. So I wanna um, end on um, something around your experience with multi multicultural marketing um, because we know yeah. you're such an expert there. So wondering if you can share with the founders here, uh, what are the top three things maybe that they should consider when targeting a multicultural audience and with their marketing? Yeah, great question. Um, I think number one, uh, get to know the people that it is that you're trying to <laughs> to reach. Uh, they'll help probably lead you in the right direction if you if you spend time empathizing. Um, if you're if it's a if it's a one way conversation where you're just trying to push a product to somebody uh, but you're not contributing, um, I think that's a, a huge huge issue, right? So there's a lot of brands that uh, want what you have, uh, being somebody that's a person of color or being uh, the diversity. They want the benefit of that, but they don't want to contribute or invest in, in that community and give back to it. So think about uh, starting with empathy um, and getting to know people, getting to know the unique tensions or the nuances that would play out differently for that group versus general population um, so that you can write design, uh, write design for them. Um, I think the, the second thing is people want to be involved with brands and with companies that don't mind showing people that look like them, right? So you may want to reach uh, folks from multicultural, but your board may look like one, <laughs> you know, may look and, and uh, if you look at the pictures of your team, right? I don't know how many proposals I get where they're like, here's the team and they're very proud of their picture. And I'm like, geez, Louise, they could use a little bit of, a little bit of color here, if you know what I mean? Um, and, it, and it becomes a little deflating, right? So think about that for your consumers, how you show up as an organization oftentimes will help you get some of the credibility and, and what it is that you want to do from a marketing, uh, a marketing angle. And then that third piece I said, I'd say is, you know, you're empathizing, you're thinking about what you're doing internally. Um, and, and I'd say just stay up to date, like learn, become a sponge, right? Um, some of these conversations are going to happen because you talk to folks that, that look like the folks that you want to reach. Others of them uh, happen because you just stay involved in different communities, because you care about people, because you show up as a human first, um, and because you don't take a, a spirit of arrogance, you take it a spirit of humility. So I would say approach um, multicultural marketing with humility, uh, definitely focus on empathizing, and then do a gut check of your own organization and the people in leadership and the people that work in different facets of it, and what's the diversity look like there? Because if you can't do it internally, there's no point in you pandering uh, externally. Ooh, that was sharp. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. <laughs> you can't do it internally. There's no point of pandering to those folks uh, outside of your organization and trying to, to think that you deserve to be there. I think we're going to have to make that a Twitter quote. Right? That, that was <laughs> awesome, Tiana. <laughs> um, well, we're about at time here. So I just want to say uh, thank you again, Tiana, so much for all of these really, really fantastic insights. Thank you. Um, and thanks everyone who was able to join us today or is watching this recording afterwards. Um, you can find the next office hours, uh, the next AMA session uh, with a PepsiCo expert will be November 7th. And you can register for that and see the recording of this session in the Woman Made community on HelloLS.com, um, which I've just put in the chat there. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you again, Tiana. This was a really lovely discussion and thank you. I feel like we all learned so much.
Well, everybody on the call, you guys are awesome. Well done. I mean, founders, it's amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep experimenting. This is a ton of fun. Be proud of yourself. Enjoy every day. This is great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll share um, this recording and um, Tiana's email address in the follow-up email for this session. So thank you all so much for joining um, and we'll see you next time. Bye.